Paul's Cathedral in San Diego. Welcome to our altar party who are here and to all who are watching at home. My name is Penny Bridges. I serve as the Dean or Senior Pastor of St. Paul's and it's my joy to welcome you, whoever you are and wherever you find yourself in the journey of faith. Please know that you are most welcome to participate in all that we do here at St. Paul's. And we hope to be back uh, with a full congregation in the church very soon. If you're celebrating a birthday or an anniversary this week, I'd like to say a prayer for you. Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of their life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We had the first part of a very interesting forum this morning. Our nine o'clock Sunday forums are on Zoom. And uh, today, Dan Love did the first half of a session, a conversation really about change and life and death and how we adapt and how we grieve. And I hope that you will join us next Sunday on Zoom at nine o'clock for the second half of that forum. Our children and youth ministries continue to happen, um, though currently they are on Zoom. On Thursday evening, our Women Together group will meet via Zoom for their February meeting. Uh, Laurel Mathewson, the rector of St. Luke's North Park, and two of her parishioners will talk about reaching across cultures with love and humility to do ministry together. If you plan to attend that um, event, please sign up online by the end of day tomorrow. The Requiem Eucharist for the very Reverend James Carroll, first Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral, will take place on Saturday, February 12th at 10.30 a.m. and it will be um, in person, although we are inviting all who can to watch it online because it will be live streamed and there will be limited seating available in the cathedral. And then at two o'clock on the same day, February 12th, we will celebrate the life of parishioner Stacy Sullivan. And now let us gather to worship. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Glory to God in the highest.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you govern all things, both in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people, and in our time grant us your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord. from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. If I speak in tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, 
but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, and these three, and the greatest of these is love. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. In the synagogue at Nazareth, Jesus read from the book of the prophet Isaiah and began to say, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my lips and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. When I try to put myself in the shoes of someone listening to Jesus when he said this at the synagogue, I imagine it as an utterly baffling statement. In Luke's gospel, Jesus is a known quantity in his hometown, a strong and wise teacher who they knew as a mere child. They likely knew and retold the stories in only the way folks in a small town do about Jesus getting lost at the temple in Jerusalem as a young boy, among other morsels of Jesus' life and youth that are now lost to us. From that incident on, the Gospel of Luke tells us that Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. Josh, as they likely knew him, was a stand-up guy from an interesting family. Everyone there likes and respects him, even as he proclaims something that would very well come off as blasphemous. 
But the Jesus who uttered that blasphemous, uh, that blasphemous sentence is not the exact same youth they remember admiring. This Jesus has been radicalized in the River Jordan by John the Baptizer and was isolated for 40 days with little sustenance and since then has gone on a preaching tour. Luke's gospel is sure to tell us again that Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in the synagogues and was praised by everyone. What happens next seems a fiery flash from the self-proclaimed fulfillment of Scripture. After those present say, is this not Joseph's son? Jesus goes ballistic. Then we are told, everyone in the synagogue flew into a rage and sent Jesus packing. And according to the gospel, they tried to push him off a cliff. Somehow, Jesus slips through the Fuhrer and heads to Capernaum. Depending on how we view Jesus' words and the crowd's reaction, we could end up in some dangerous and anti-Semitic theological places. For instance, many have concluded that those in the synagogue are mad at Jesus for having good news for non-Jews. That's why I want to slow down here and pay close attention to what Luke records Jesus saying what his words are that, crowd, that the crowd becomes angered by and incorporate one or two historical facts along the way. He's just read from the book of the prophet Isaiah proclaiming that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. After they marvel at Jesus openly, instead of manifesting what he's just read right there and then, Jesus goes on the offensive. Side note here, this is the only place in all of the Gospels that we have direct evidence that Jesus can in fact read. He exclaims that doubtless they will tell him to cure himself and then says, and you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. Whatever those events in Capernaum were, Luke's gospel says nothing of them. But we can presume that they were miracles or some other great act of power, especially based on what Jesus says next. He goes on to say that the prophets aren't accepted in their hometowns and references two stories about the greatest prophets in Hebrew scripture after Moses, Elijah and Elisha. We just covered both of those stories over the last few months in our young adult Bible study, which takes place on second and fourth Wednesdays every evening over Zoom for those interested. And has been reading, we have been reading through those stories over the last few months, as I said. Both involve healing and non-Jewish people being recipients of healing. Elijah calls a drought to punish the wicked reign of King Ahab of Israel for his idolatry and devious ways. Elijah then traveled to Zarephath, a city of coastal Lebanon, where he encountered a widow gathering wood for a fire and asked her for water. And as she's setting out to go get it for him, asks additionally for some bread. She told him, as the Lord your God lives, notice your God, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterwards, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of meal will not be emptied and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she, as well as her household, ate for many days. 
The jar of meal was not emptied, neither did the jug of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord that had been spoken by Elijah. Following this, her son ceased to breathe such such that there was no breath left in him, and she asks Elijah what he as a man of God has against her. And Elijah takes the boy, cries out to God, and miraculously resuscitates the child. So the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. It's Elijah's success as a wonder worker that convinces her that he is a powerful prophet of God. God's abundance and care become known to nameless foreigners through the prophet Elijah. Elisha, the successor to Elijah, mirrors the power of God's prophets to provide healing in the story Jesus quotes. Naaman, a great warrior of the kingdom of Aram, modern-day Damascus to us, has a skin disease that needs healing. Naaman happens to have in his household a servant girl for his wife that had been captured on a raid in Israel. The girl knows Elisha's power and tells Naaman that if anyone can cure his disease, it is that prophet of God. Naaman's king of Aram sends gifts and a letter to the king of Israel requesting entrance for Naaman into Israel for his healing. The king of Israel in this story is totally unaware of Elisha's power and is so distressed that this might be a pretext for invasion that word reaches Elisha of the king's distress. And Elisha writes to him, specifically to tell him to calm down and send Naaman his way. Naaman goes to Elisha, requests healing, and Elisha tells him to bathe seven times in the river Jordan. Naaman is baffled that he must bathe seven times in such a, frankly, filthy river. But his unnamed servants encourage him to do the bafflingly simple thing. Naaman finally does the simple task, and once he is out out of the water for the seventh time, he sees that his skin is completely healed and exclaims that there is no God but the one Elisha serves. Both stories offer characters from outside Israel who come to know God's power through amazing works of healing and through feeding starving people, though that occurrence happens elsewhere for Elisha. Both stories show how people at the lowest rungs in their societies, widows and children, captured and enslaved people, and other nameless ones, trust and know God's power, or at least where to look for it. While the powerful and the mighty are angry and scared until they too see God's revelation through these prophets. The people in the synagogue know all these same stories backwards and forwards, and they know what Jesus is telling them. And they are not upset about foreigners receiving revelation. After all, the temple in Jerusalem has a court specifically for Gentiles and you would not build a place for them in the most sacred location on the planet, the most sacred space on the planet, if you didn't think they belonged. What these folks are upset about is that Jesus will not perform such miracles for them like the ones of Elijah and Elisha and whatever apparently happened in Capernaum. Jesus is telling them that he will not be an amusement for them that he's not going to perform wild miracles to convince them of the power of his ensuing ministry. They want, and perhaps demand, his messianic blessings, and Jesus will not give it, and so they are enraged. How often do I expect God to deliver miracles where my prayers of supplication ought also be prayers of intention that lead towards action? How often do I hope for God to intervene when really the work is for me to do? 
How often do I want God to solve the problems that I simply wish to ignore? It all comes down to the desire for at least the illusion of control, if not the hope for the reality of control. And what a fool I am if I think I can control much of anything in life, let alone the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the subversiveness of Scripture and what Jesus is saying to those in his hometown. And it has upset princes and principalities since the moment Jesus started his earthly ministry till now. The lowly and nameless show us the power of God at work in the world to inspire faith, hope, and love for all people. Love overcomes the boundaries of empires and castes, death and all manner of division and disconnection. We can participate by living a life that follows Jesus. We must live lives of love, remembering these words of our patron, St. Paul. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. May we rejoice in God's love and pour it out into the world around us so that we may see where God may be calling us. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. 
We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for the welfare of the world for your creation, especially in this critical time of climate change, and for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who sleep outside and on all who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. For Elaine Mathis, Anne Pund, Hal Sadler, Jeanette Thomas, James Carroll, Virginia Richardson, Stacy Sullivan, Helen Fasina, and for those we now name. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. For Debbie Carver, Judy Moore, Harold Potter, Patrick McDonnell, the family of Elaine Mathis, Bob Shiaqua, Danisha, Karzina Butler, Regina King and their families, Jim Mullins, Guillermo Gonzalez, the family of James Carroll, Michael Falzoni, the family of Stacy Sullivan, Evie Neji, the family of Diana Bates, Alex and Taylor Milam Samuel, Joe Letzkus, Evadne Joseph, Caroline, Stuart Turner, and for those we now name. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life, especially for our retired and newly elected chapter members. Lord, hear the prayers of thy people, and what we have asked faithfully, grant that we may obtain effectually to the glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with the blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Paul and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Alleluia! This is the table not of the church, but of Jesus Christ. It is made ready for those who love him and who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith, and you who have little, 
you who have been here often and you who have not been for a long time or ever before, you who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come not because the church invites you, it is Christ, and he invites you to meet him here, the gifts of God for the people of God. My Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Christ, Amen. I want to invite Diana Cho to come forward. Diana has been a part of the cathedral's life for several years. Before the pandemic, she used to attend weekday services, and as we went online, she became more active and a beloved member of the, daily, the Zoom daily office group. 
Now Diana is taking a wonderful professional opportunity in her field of art history and moving to the Boston area. I believe she intends to continue with EFM, even though it'll make for a very late night. Diana, we will miss you. To send you on your way as a St. Paul's missionary to Massachusetts, let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the holy food of the body and blood of your Son, and for uniting us through him in the fellowship of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for raising up among us faithful servants for every task in your church. And we thank you especially for Diana's participation in our ministries. We ask your blessing on her as she moves across the country to a new home and a new chapter in her life. We ask that you will bless Diana in her work and give her success, and that you will guide her to a church that will offer her meaningful and fulfilling ministry. Grant that we and Diana may all serve you in the days ahead, always rejoicing in your glory, and come at length into your heavenly kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May Christ the Son of God be manifest in you, that your lives may be a light to the world, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.